hienachti miecha la kolcha je troka hea inaji machiapi yani a unchiwa e che chashmaki tro ona a ia oslahe e mataha e ituhu cha wakpala he awa utaha washicho gena wakpala sata kore e api cha awa ti na um Lecia a Sintegleshka Oaiwa Leo Micho Pichanke Wahina ha a Tokeshke Shiotanka Kahena ha Yajo Echechche Uspewichaki na Isha a Tokeshke Changleshka Yihawa Chipi a Isha a Uspewichaki Uchanke ona washicho gana blau trankta So uh, good morning my name is Kevin Lock and I'm really happy to be here. I uh, came from the uh, Standing Rock Reservation area from my little community of Wakpala. And I'm very pleased to be invited uh, by Sintegleshka University to uh, do some presentations, especially regarding things that I enjoy. And uh, one of the things we've been doing here is to do uh, flute workshops, both to play the flute and also to make the flute. And I'm holding in my hand, my hands a, uh, a flute. This flute was made by a gentleman. His name was uh, Brian uh, Akipa, and Brian is from Sisseton. And uh, years ago, he got an interest in making flutes. And um, so, since about 1980 or prior to 1980, he's been making the traditional tuned flutes. And I wanted to mention that the flutes that uh, were used historically by the Sichanghu, also the all the other Lakota bands, the Sisi Twa Wakpe Twa Wakpe Kute, Dewakatwa. Really, all of the uh, throughout all the prairies and the woodlands, whether it's the Menominee, Meskwaki, Ojibwe, Ho Chunk, Pawnee, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Kiowa, Comanche, Omaha, Ponca, whatever tribe, they're very uniform in the, um, the, the scale or inter intervals used in creating the flutes. And so these are the kind of flutes that uh, we made here at uh, SGU the last couple of days. And also the flutes that are here at the, maybe at the museum and uh, Father Beagle Museum in St. Francis. Long story short, the tuning was changed. And so these flutes uh, became known as Native American flutes, Native American flutes. So if you go on the internet and you type out Native American flute, you'll, you'll probably find hundreds if not thousands of sites or links there that uh, have people who have written books, uh, sell these flutes, have made recordings, thousands of recordings on the Native American flute. And basically that's all you find now. But I hasten to add that those flutes and that tuning system are not related to any indigenous North American musical aesthetic. <laughs> and uh, that's why I'm really happy that we could, we could uh, create a movement or initiative to preserve the traditional tuning. And so that's the kind of flutes we've been making here at Sintegleshka University. And uh, the goal that I have and my colleague who's helping me with this project is to repatriate or reintroduce the original tuning system that was developed here. And the reason why I know that it's the original tuning system is because the body of music which developed, the genre of music which developed, is very unique. The rules of composition are very unique uh, to this particular genre and could really be described as a, uh, as a, uh, as a unique literary tradition from North America because the songs are, uh, they call them courting songs or love songs. In uh, Lakota language there's other words that could be used. Uh, they call them we iloa naish, we ku oloa naish, we oyuspa oloa naish, we oishte 
Oloa. They use different terminology to describe this type of music. And these kind of songs that are used on the flute are, are roughly analogous to um, maybe country western songs in which some of the themes involved are, involved are truly romantic themes. Some of them are, are more about a person who might have been uh, jilted. A lot of the songs are about unrequited love. Uh, probably the majority of the songs are concerning people who are seriously romantically challenged. And so uh, these are the kind of songs that are used. So as you can, as you can probably imagine, they, they, are, they are very analogous to country western songs, you know, where the person is, is, you know, is maybe heartbroken or something like this. So that's, and uh, um, so I'll give an example of that since I mentioned it now. I'll, I'd like to play a song that I heard, uh, learned from a gentleman uh, many, many years ago, and his name was uh, uh, William Blacklance, uh, known as Bill Blacklance. Uh, a lot of people don't know this. They just think that the flute music exists in isolation. But in actuality, all the flute melodies are based on a vocal composition. So now I'd like to do one of these songs from uh, Mr. Uh, Bill Blacklance, the late Mr. Bill Blacklance. <laughs> is saying why did you uh, why did you speak that way you know takuwe oyagalake why did you why did you say those things or why did you why did you express yourself that way and then the person says uh, person says uh, 
that really um, hurt me. That really hurt me a lot, and it really affected me like that. And then the then the person says the next time. Uh, oh, I was going to say that um, these songs they form uh, they are formulaic in their rules of composition. So if you if you look at that song, you'll hear that that phrase. Uh, it's repeated three times at the beginning of the song. And really, th this formula is uniform throughout this genre of music in terms of the composition. And so, it's, I would say it's much akin to a, um, a poetic tradition, which is popular worldwide, known as haiku. I think people have heard of this. It's a Japanese form of poetry in which the first line of the of the poem is very cryptic. The meaning is hidden. You can't really, you hear that or you, you, you read the, the haiku poetry and you say, what's that about? Just like these songs, you don't know what it's about. But then the second part of the song will like reveal or disclose more insight into the first part. So it's very poetic. Uh, it's, a, it's a really a North American uh, poetic form of literature. And so then the second part gives more insight. You don't know the full story, but the, the person says, uh, the person says, well, if it's not going to work out for us here in this world, like, you know, right here, the person says, over there, machpiata yeche tukta, over there in the, in the uh, heavenly worlds beyond, it'll work out for us over there, see? Beautiful, these kind of songs are basically from the pre-reservation and early reservation period. So uh, it's beautiful, you know, you have so many Lakota speakers here at uh, Rosebud, Sichanghu, Oyanke, Ktalila, you know, Tona Ya Galaps, Anayupia, Lakulia, Pichanke, Lila, Wichota. A lot of fluent speakers, you know. So they hear these songs and they, it's, it's beautiful because the, uh, the vocabulary and the sentence structure really is, is like, a, like a snapshot of a time past. But you know, the people, people speak the language here, they know all that. So then they can get all this beautiful sentence structure and grammatical constructions, it's beautiful. See, even these songs, these, uh, these so-called courting songs or whatever, although like we said, they, they, they replicate themes in the blues and country western, things like that. That's all talking about love, you see. Which, in a way, if you really get down really deep into it, is uh, is uh, is analogous or is a, is a metaphor for our relationship with the higher power too. Yeah. You know, the disconnect that occurs, yeah. the heartbreak that occurs, the alienation that occurs when we're cut off from our yeah. higher source. So, in a way, it, it is it it's all does it all parallels. It's all parallel. <laughs>
At the end, with all the hills, I uh, made a design of the eagle. So when the eagle looks down, the eagle does not see all these fence lines, state lines, borders. Doesn't see that. The only thing the eagle can see is this world, the hoop of the world, where everybody has a place. That's why I use those four colors in there. To remind us that we're all connected. Doesn't matter what color you are, we've got a place inside there. So then what happens if anybody gets left out? You figure it out? Doesn't matter which one you take out. I know uh, maybe the uh, young people here, they might think of themselves as being from a minority culture, Lakota culture, but yet we here have the missing element that will help to unite humanity. And without the people here, what they have to offer, the beautiful gifts, the strengths, without that, what happens? Okay. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. So what, what I learned from that is that we all can connect. We all can uh, see where we fit in this beautiful design of unity. As we do this, then truly we can progress, we can advance on that journey of life. And surely there's a lot of obstacles we have to overcome. And we can't really do it singly and alone. But together we can overcome that. Cross that bridge and go beyond that rainbow. Climb that ladder of knowledge. Maybe it's a mountain. But we get to the top. Can't turn back. Can't turn back. We just have to go on. Use our wings of knowledge. Then as we soar, then new uh, things will open up before us. To be able to see things. Just like that ego. And we'll be able to create a good foundation for our little guys. Because every ego needs a nest, right? So we all need that. We have uh, two eagle nests in my district. And I love to watch them year round to see how those eagles develop eaglets. But they have their nests up high. So those big eagles have to be strong to survive once they take flight. So we all need this, you and I as eagles. We need to create that for our children, our little ones. Like for myself, I have seven grandkids now. So we need to create a nice safety net, a nice secure place. A place where they can stand tall and light. A place where they can open their eyes. A place where they can stretch their wings, of course. You know, achieve their way in life.